Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. A little over a year ago, I had my friend John Tamney on the show to talk about his then new book. Uh, turns out to be quite a prescient book. The title of it is When Politicians Panicked, The New Cor Cor Coronavirus, Expert Opinion, and a Tragic Lapse of Reason. Here's how I introduced the book back then. Uh, the book's premise is that the so-called experts are not the answer to the crisis, to a crisis. They are the crisis. What was needed at the outset of the virus was leadership wise enough to let sensible Americans figure out how to protect themselves. Instead of draconic, dr draconian lockdowns and mandates, our political leaders needed to provide information and guidelines about the risks, protect the vulnerable and their caregivers, and otherwise let people take care of themselves and each other. Give people the facts and a little bit of guidance and their native intelligence and common sense will see them through. Well, that did not happen. <laughs> and now, almost two years on, we're seeing the catastrophic economic and social cost of the overreaction and overreach by governments, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And so joining me to help figure out where we go from here are, are John Tamney, our author friend and economist, and and Don Boudreau, and Don Boudreau is a particular note, he runs a operation, a blog called Cafe Hayek, which has become sort of the go-to go source for COVID-19 information and related. And if, if you want to learn about how you should really think about that, I would recommend that blog. Uh, John, I'll reintroduce. He's, uh, by the way, Don's also a professor of economics at George Mason and author of many best-selling books in economics. Uh, John's the editor of Real Clear Markets, uh, author of End of Work, End of Work, and They're Both Wrong, and When Politicians Panicked. Yes. So welcome back, guys. We had you on, I guess, about eight months ago or something. Uh, no, it was, it was summer of last year. Summer of last yeah. year. Oh, my gosh. Time flies. COVID uh, time flies even faster. COVID time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's distorting. Yeah. Don, why don't we kick off? We're, 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 describe where we are. With COVID? Yeah. You know, it, it's hard to say, Bill. I mean, I, it seems at the moment that the fear of the Delta variant is receding a little bit, and so maybe we're returning to normal yet again. But we've been down this road before. Another variant's going to come up. Uh, as winter comes on, the cold weather comes on around the country, people are going to hunker down more in homes. There are going to be rises in cases. I fear that people will panic. I, I, I hope the panic will be less than it has been in the past, but I'm not at all confident that it won't be. As, as you know, as John talks about, as I'm sure you've talked about in the show before, as I talk about all the time, this, this obsessive focus on COVID cases is insane. Um, being t testing positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus does not mean that you're ill, does not mean you're going to suffer any significant uh, 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 disease consequences. And yet we keep this up. We have this obsessive uh, uh, insistence on counting these COVID cases. So I worry that as the cold months come and we start counting these COVID cases, the cases are going to rise and, and panic is going to ensue again. So uh, it, it, I, I just, I, we're to the point where I cannot have any confidence in any optimistic feelings that might uh, occur to me. Uh, I tend to agree with Don, and particularly when we're around here, it feels like it hasn't ended and it's disturbing. You see people in masks everywhere. It just seems they've accepted this taking of freedom and they've moved on. Mm. But it's interesting to point out, get outside of what we constantly talk about as, as this bubble. Madison, Wisconsin, are you kidding me? Madison, left wing Madison. Did you see the football stadium opening week of the season packed with people living their lives again? If you get out to Nashville, Tennessee, you almost feel like there's there's been no lockdowns people have gotten on with their lives and so i think to some degree there's a there's a geographical thing if you, and it, because it's a political thing it's been a political thing for a while people were, were wearing their masks as they drove along in their car and as a way of saying okay i side with the left and so i think once you get out of dc 
it seems like in many ways the pandemic has ended. I, I, I agree with that. Some of my best friends live in Basalt, Colorado, just outside of Aspen, which is pretty, that's a pretty blue part of that state. And, and they tell me that people in that part of the state, you know, I, I, I described the mask wearing in my hometown of Fairfax, where I live. And he said, there's nothing like that here. Very right. few people wear masks. So. Well, it's become political. It's become political. You know, I had Jeffrey says. Tucker on a couple of weeks ago, and he, I said, you know, so Jeffrey, there's a lot of evidence that, matter of fact, massive evidence that masks don't work. <laughs> he said, no, they do work. <laughs> they signal which side of the political aisle you're on. Yeah. And it really has become something where it's a virtue signal for people on the left. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, in, the, in Montgomery County and, and surrounding areas in D.C., it, it's, it, you know, if you're not wearing your mask, you're, you're not part of the club. Political costume. It's a political costume. Mm -hmm. So how lethal is the virus? How, I mean, how much was all this reaction we had worth it? I mean, did we, did we stop the, uh, the flu of, you know, 1918 uh, Spanish flu? I mean, is, where, where are we? It certainly wasn't that, that lethal look. I mean, I think it, 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 it is a serious disease, particularly if you're old or your health is compromised. It has killed people. Uh, I've never denied its existence. I've never said it's not, it's not dangerous. But the proportion of the reaction uh, to COVID has been way excessive. It's been far out of proportion to the underlying dangers. I don't. Un there are a lot of people who refuse to acknowledge that the age distribution of COVID's negative impacts is relevant. But we've known since March of last year, so March of 2020, right when this thing first became big, we've known that COVID overwhelmingly reserves its ill effects for very old people, people in their 80s. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I still encounter people who say, oh, that's irrelevant. We shouldn't care about that. Well, of course we should care about that. that that's a relevant fact for two reasons. N number one, it, it's just a fact. That, I mean, people might not like this, but when someone in their 80s dies, it's sad, it's not tragic, unlike when someone in their 20s or 30s or a teenager dies. Second, because we know that it affects mostly old people, overwhelmingly old people, that means we could have, as the Great Barrington Declaration advised, we could have focused our protection on that vulnerable group. Instead, we have this one-size-fits-all, nonsensical, insane lockdown that doesn't focus protection. And I think, the, I think there's some compelling evidence that the lockdowns actually wound up being more lethal than the lethality we would have suffered had we followed the advice given in the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, there, there's no question, and, and I would just not one-up, Don. I would say we knew from long before March that the virus was real but not terribly lethal, and we knew this from China. Uh, China's the second largest market for McDonald's, for Nike, for the, for the Hollywood box office. Uh, there's 4,200 Starbucks in China. If it had been a lethal killer, there's no way it could have been hidden from a country like that. Look at even Cuba recently. Videos were getting out of people of people protesting an economically primitive country like that. You think the censors could have hidden mass death, but but I think we have to take it further. What if it had been a major killer of Chinese people, tens of millions? If that's the case, the argument for lockdowns becomes even more ridiculous. Who among us needs to be forced to avoid behavior associated with death and hospitalization? The more lethal something is the more important liberty is precisely because that's when you need to find out most by free people acting what is the behavior most associated with sickness and death. Instead, while claiming it was lethal and a danger to us, they chose to blind us by locking us down. One size fits all solutions well, when we needed broad answers. Well, the, the thing that's striking, though, is that the, 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 we're not just talking about freedom of movement. We're talking about freedom of speech. We're talking about the, the real blackout of certain topics. For example, you're not allowed to talk about ivermectin. You're not allowed to talk about uh, whether the vaccines are, are effective. I mean, right now, YouTube's pulling everything that's, uh, that's uh, even slightly skeptical about vaccines. So, John, in some, true, in some sense, that's true. People could figure it out. But right now, people aren't allowed to have a free discussion because there are only certain answers that you're allowed to, conclusions you're allowed to reach about this. Yeah, so look, Martin Kulldorff, one of the authors of the a Great Barrington at Harvard. Declaration, the yeah. guy at Harvard, yeah. uh, uh, he writes frequently, and I think he's exactly correct, that, I mean, he's not the only one, but he's a, one of the more, more articulate 
people who write on this. He says, look, science is really taken a beating in this whole episode. Uh, uh, the, uh, the assumption that there is one correct answer and that any scientific dissent uh, from that one correct answer uh, is somehow illegitimate. This is really just dogmatism. It's not science. And so the, 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 the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, the proposal that they put forward just about a year ago, in October of 2020, in, in effect uh, advocated what all uh, 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 the best public health experts until that time, well, until January of last year, advocated. Uh, and, and suddenly, within a matter of months, the longstanding consensus among public health uh, scholars and researchers Got, gets cast aside and then declared to be a heresy. And if you dare even mention the heresy, you are stifled, you are, you're, 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 you're cut off, and you're, you're silenced. And, uh, and so science itself, the people who are supposed to uphold the values of scientific inquiry and discourse, uh, they've fallen down on the job. And that means I think science has taken a big hit. Well, it... it, 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 it. Science has taken it. There are a lot of places I want to take this. One of the things you and I talked about before was this notion, and John, you know this very well, this idea in economics, one of the iron laws is the, is the seen and the unseen, and that people take a look at a, a, an immediate consequence of something, let's say stopping a virus, that's the thing you see. But what you don't see are all the things that are happening like all the other health consequences, all the other public health issues, the excess deaths from not getting cancer treatment screenings, from heart disease, from diabetes, from alcoholism, from uh, you know, on and on. So when we talk about excess deaths, the, the, I think the real excess deaths may be the ones that are not directly due to COVID, but they're due to the lockdowns. Yeah, people, not, people not getting their cancer screenings, as you point out, people not going to doctors. People afraid when they get injuries in some cases of not going to the hospital to take care of their injuries, and you know people talk about about long long COVID. Right? There's this alleged you know the long lasting consequence. What is what is long COVID? <laughs> so you get COVID, you survive, uh, but but you might have some lasting consequences that last for who knows how long. I mean, COVID's only been around for a couple of years, uh, but but one of the arguments that that is constantly thrown at me when I advise against the hysteria that we've all experienced is, oh, when I point out, well, look, you know, the, the fatality rates actually, it's not so high as to justify this excessive reaction. Oh, yeah, but what about long COVID, right? It, yeah, maybe not everyone's dying, but, but, but they're suffering. And the data on long COVID, I think, are pretty sketchy. Uh, yeah. but, but, but even if there's such a thing as long COVID, uh, uh, what I worry about most is long lockdown. I worry about the lasting consequences of the, uh, you know, to, to, to the economy and to the polity, to society, to the legal system of what's happened in the past 18 months. We've set, uh, we've set a precedent that, I, I, you know, in January of 2020, I would not have believed we could possibly have set. We've just basically allowed the experts in government to say, okay, we, we are your lab rats. You tell us what to do in order to save us from this one pathogen doesn't matter if we suffer in any other way, but just save us from this one pathogen. And that's the attitude that too many people, at least for a while, came to have. Well, and if you're, if you're Anthony, Co uh, Anthony Fauci and you trade, he's an epidemi epidemi epidemiologist. Word for epidemiologist. Yeah, something like <laughs> I'm not sure what his actual degree is. <laughs> what, what, he's a medical doctor, yeah. Uh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with uh, Don Vidro and John Tamney, and we're talking about the... Uh, the, the cost that uh, COVID has caused, uh, the real price we're paying in terms of our freedom. I mean, John, you've, you, I can't think of anybody who's more of an advocate for free market, voluntary exchange. Well, maybe you, I, well, I we're think you same, guys we're are good group. Group. I don't think we know. all are. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, you look at the economic consequences of this. We're now seeing supply chain issues. We're looking at, uh, you know, uh, all these issues with, with people not wanting to go back to work because of the government. It seems like all the measures that government took really wrecked the economy long term. Talk about long term, long COVID, long, uh, long lockdown. I think the long hammer that's been put on the free market is, uh, is stunning. And, and it's, it was needless. Let's not forget that the virus had been spreading for months. It had been in the news in the U.S. alone since January of 2020, and businesses were responding. They were changing. Uh, 
they, they started wiping down more regularly. They started removing, removing tables long before the lockdowns began because they were adjusting to what their customers wanted, um, a, a, a different, a, a more scared customer base. And so, but you talk about the economics. Let's never forget that, as Don knows vividly, what's that eye pencil? The pencil is a con consequence of global cooperation. When we, rich America, when we take a break from reality as we've done, the global implications are tragic because so much of the economic activity happening here is global in scope. And so you look at a country like El Salvador, much of its ability, the consumption there is a consequence of economic activity here. So when tens of millions of jobs are lost, suddenly the El Salvadorans are putting white flags up on, the, on their huts. And a white flag in El Salvador is a sign that there is starvation happening in this hut. And you look globally in Philippines, you look in India, the remittances to these countries from their relatives in the U.S. and in developed countries around the world plummeted such that even the New York Times was admitting 285 million people around the world rushing towards starvation as we, in the rich countries, experience mass hysteria over a virus. Uh, the, the, the hatred of poor people well, that this has exhibited is, is nothing short of awe-inspiring. Well, this, this thing is disproportionately at poor people. I mean, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if you're working in the digital economy, you're doing just fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, if, if, you're, if you're the delivery man, you're not doing so well. You, I want to plug what you, the book you just mentioned, or the essay, I Pencil, mm -hmm. Leonard Reed. Leonard Reed. And it really talks about all the different facets of, you know, if you make a pencil, you've got the metal, you've got the rubber tip, you've got the lead, you've got the wood, and there are thousands of people in industries that, or manufacturers that go into making just a simple pencil. That gets me back to one of the, my pet peeves is this idea early on where they could take some mayor and she could declare or some governor this business is essential this business is not essential and they went so far as sort of sub subdividing home depot and said well this department's essential this one's not you guys are economists Ex explain why that's crazy because john alluded to it the economy is a, there's a vast network of interconnected specializations. And so you know, even the, you might, people might say, oh, you know, physicians are really essential because they, they save lives. But well, physicians need to eat. Physicians need their equipment. Phys right. Physicians need their supplies delivered. So we, we, we are all part of this global economy. We're all highly specialized in what we do. And if you, if you obstruct one part of it, that has ripple effects in ways that no one can predict in detail, but it has ripple effects throughout the economy. Uh, so, so even if we would all, again, to agree that, you know, Bill Walton is more essential than Don Boudreau, shutting down Don Boudreau might still uh, 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 impact Mrs. your Boudreau ability to do disagree. what you do. What's that? Mrs. Boudreau may disagree. Well, she might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's basically the yeah. thing, though, is that yeah. you're, you're, you're valuable, you're not. Yeah. And they said that to tens of millions of people. Yeah. You speak about outside the, in the United States, I mean, people's, I got a phone call from um, a caddy at my club who got kicked out in uh, March of 2020. I, you and I talked yeah. about it. He was absolutely, he said, Bill, they've declared me a non-person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not essential. Terrible. And he didn't have a long train of, uh, you know, I think, you know, he, he worked in a cash economy, so he, he was not able to get the relief that other people got. Mm -hmm. Yep, suddenly people were told they didn't count. And you think about the, the illogic of it. Again, I think it's important to always just stick. The freedom is, is the answer, always. The freedom was the answer to this. But we, it was illegal to go into a flower shop. It was illegal to go into a clothing store. It was, it was illegal to do, but you could go to Walmart and get all those things. And so the supposition was that the very humans who've driven all economic progress were suddenly a lethal menace, that if I was around you, I was going to kill you if I got too close. And so you think about that. So it's based on this ludicrous supposition. So let's narrow the, the range of businesses that people can shoehorn themselves through as a solution. I mean, yeah. everything about this defied basic common sense. And that's why it's, I think it's so important what we're doing, writing, talking but, about but, this but, stuff. But why do we feel like such lonely voices in this? I mean, I, I, you know, I look at some of the institutions on, in the libertarian world and, and the conservative world, and 
they folded like a tent early on. I mean, everybody got terrified by this as something that was, I mean, we've had flus, we've had viruses, we've had things, we, and we've dealt with them. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, we came out of all this draconian stuff, and nobody really fought back. Heritage didn't fight back. Uh, um, Cato didn't Cato fight did. back. Uh, I mean, for I'm a donor, so I don't. Yeah. I get to. I get to say things. <laughs> but there are a whole lot of the institutions or, or think tanks or people on our side who just just did not fight back. I, I was. Uh, go ahead, John. I was a young, very young, in Boston in 1972 because my parents were living there, and they were stunned when Nixon won 49 states to one because Boston, as people, it's a very <clears throat> collegiate, it's a very left-leaning. And I think to some degree, again, are we lonely voices? Probably we're lonely voices in Washington, D.C., but it's kind of interesting. I to, think you're right. Um, you're I out think you're right. You, 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 you get I'm, out of town, I'm get, you got sensible people. Well, so you and Sarah are out in Rappahannock on weekends. I'm yeah. guessing you're running into an entirely different viewpoint on all this. It's just a speculation. But, 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 but it is true that, that a, a, a lot of the people, not all, but a lot of the people and organizations who and that I would have expected 18 months ago to be furious in a vocal way against this unprecedented assault on human liberty were quiet, didn't say anything. And I, 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 I don't understand. I could not keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. about I could not keep my keyboard silent on it because short of a hot shooting war I believe this is perhaps the worst calamity certainly that modern human we, we modern human beings have inflicted on ourselves I don't think anything comes close I don't want to compare it to a hot shooting war but short of that this is just it's, it's appalling and that's I don't have a word strong enough actually so, but you get shouted down. Maybe shouted is too strong a word, but you're shamed into thinking, well, if you don't, if you're, if you're for the things we want, which is to let people take care of themselves and their families and take sensible precautions. I mean, it used to be you got a cold, you just didn't go out mm -hmm. and you didn't walk around with a mask on. But I mean, you've, you've done, you've gotten people saying because of your position, um, you've got blood in your hands. I've had people tell me, literally, I have blood on my hands, as, as if I've had any impact on policy, <laughs> which, which, of course, I haven't. But because I advocate against the, the, the lockdown policies and against the hysteria, I've had people literally tell me I have blood on my hands, and I don't understand it. I mean, it just leaves... I don't get angry at it. I get saddened mm -hmm. and, 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 and mystified it. It's just sad. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Um, uh, we're, we're, we... we, we we have these heavy-handed, one-size-fits-all uh, obstructions on our lives that are unprecedented. Why aren't mo more of our friends speaking out against them? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, 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 well, it's, it's just it's a mystery to me. Vaccine mandates. Against them. I'm against all central planning. Why is central planning so discredited in all other ways? Because, John, it worked really well in the Soviet Union. Yeah. It's amazing. You're forgetting that success So controlling story. human action in a commercial <laughs> sense is, is just thoroughly discredited. But suddenly, when we've got this virus that is a threat to the whole world, centralized human action is, is fully supported in this case. It, it staggers the imagination that people don't see the obvious correlation, that once again, free people produce the, the, the optimal outcome precisely because they're trying different things. Well, let's, let's do it. Uh, you're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with John Tamney and Don Boudreau. We're, we're about to be educated about how things really happen at, at, the, at the granular level where people are interacting, doing things, and they, solutions don't come from top down. They, they, they can't. It, look, the Soviet Union had experts, brilliant people. Cuba has experts. North Korea's got experts. But let's never forget that the collective knowledge of the people is the marketplace, and it squashes the minimal knowledge of one person or two people. And so, and so remember, the experts said this time around, unless we act, unless, unless you do as we think you should do, there will be a crisis. Well, that was a self-fulfilling statement right there. Because once you suffocate the marketplace, which is the people, and, and then substitute in there the narrow knowledge of an Anthony Fauci, it's possible he's brilliant. 
but his knowledge can never measure up to that of the marketplace. And so they say we must act, which is in, in, inevitably the crisis, because central planning cannot replace the diffuse knowledge of people. Well, the thing that I think we need to make the point that people who think as we do ultimately have faith in people's ability to take care of themselves and in common sense and, and, and figuring things out, maybe not by themselves, but with their community, with their family, with things like that. And that through history is the way things have, have, have happened. And, and so we've got a really very positive view about about people. And yet if you're sitting there in a big office on, on uh, you know, Constitution Avenue or wherever the bureaucracies are, and you think you're going to write this edict to tell tens of millions of people how to behave, that's, that's, that's arrogance. And it's also saying those people don't know enough to take care of themselves, so it's up to us, this Miss Bureaucrat, to, uh, to do just that. And it never works. One of the many distressing events or, or attitudes that arose in the last 18 months is this notion that science uh, can answer questions of public policy. Science is important. Science can give us good information yeah. about various consequences of different paths that we choose when we choose different policies. Science cannot tell us which public policies to choose. Science cannot tell us how much risk we should take or, or avoid. Science cannot make trade-offs for us. That is inevitably uh, uh, decisions that have to be made at the collective level politically and hopefully more at the individual level. It's not a scientific, it's just not in the domain of science. And yet so many people now believe that Anthony Fauci or some other scientific genius has the answer for what we should do. And it, it, science simply can't do that. And, and no more than science can, science can tell me what my chances are of being killed as I drive home a little while from, from, from the studio here. Science cannot tell me whether or not I should drive home. It's up to me to make that choice. And, and can we just add that we expect people and we want people to exercise their common sense, but sometimes the people not exercising common sense are the most important information producers of all. They're your control group. We want everyone to act the same way. No, you wanted young kids out at the bars, you know, hitting on, making out with people and doing all the things the young kids do to find out, is it true? Is that how you spread the virus? Is it dangerous to live your life? But you see, we, all of us here know- Do you know how many teenagers would love to have you as a parent? That's right. <laughs> would, you, would you go out and be a control group for hey, us? So, <laughs> we all practice central planning in our houses. There's a big different thing, but, 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 but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to stress. You know, we're all socialists on a local level, as, as, as we know, but it, it's, it's very important to stress that you want people trying different things. And, and so when you needed, let's never forget, the Wright brothers were viewed as complete nut jobs for presuming that man could fly. It was accepted wisdom that you couldn't. So you need the oddballs trying different things to produce the crucial information. They literally, in their desire to find an answer to the virus, chose to blind us to what the answers might be. Who well, knows? Maybe it is invermectin. I don't know, but that's why you want people trying well, different I've, things. I've got some doctor friends who believe very much it's invermectin. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not a very profitable drug. Well, you know, the thing that is striking is you talk about the control group, which is funny, but we're seeing this real attack on federalism where states are not, increasingly they don't want states to come up with separate policy solutions. They want all states to look like California. And then we're seeing this in the international world where they're trying to impose a minimum tax on corporations worldwide so that people can't choose low tax countries and, and like Ireland and protect, protect. So there's this, there's this overwhelming uh, movement, I think, to centralize things right now. I mean, I thought we were making progress and now it feels like we're slipping. Yeah, I think, I, I think part of it stems from this ridiculous belief in the power of experts. If society were, an, were, a, were a science project, uh, then yeah, we find the experts in society, we give them the power to tell us what to do, but society's not a science project. It's society is a place where we interact and we each have our own preferences and my preferences differ from John's and differ from yours and, and the best we can do is to all get along as, as, as best as we can and in a free society we do that and we do so productively and we all actually wind up helping each other uh, uh, better pursue each of our ends as opposed to having some experts sitting in Washington DC or in some world capital telling us what to do. But, but the belief of academics now, the belief of so many people in the media now 
is that society is a science project and there's a correct answer out there. And all we have to do is find that correct answer. Yeah, there's no doubt. And I think one of the biggest myths is that we actually had federalism this time around. People say, well, you know, Florida locked down on April 3rd and New York locked down on March 15th. There are, there are different. OK, there are different responses. But we didn't really have federalism. Ask yourself the question, what if the federal government had stayed out of this? What if Donald Trump had stayed to type obstreperous Donald Trump and said, you know, look, if states want to lock down, that's fine, but they're going to have me to deal with. I'm going to campaign against them every day. Instead, we got a $2.9 trillion CARES Act from the federal government that subsidized the lockdowns in California. Ask yourself the question, could California have locked down even for a week if there had been no federal money coming in? I think the question answers itself. Mm -hmm. If the federal government stays out of this, which it should have, so that states can be the laboratories of ideas that we all want, there would have been an entirely different response. The federal government's role in this cannot be minimized. And this includes from Republicans. I just, let's never forget that Republicans panicked too. Yes, they did. Including Trump. Mm -hmm. Including Trump. Yeah, Unquestionably. Well, I, I, People I, forget that. I, yeah, I, I'd worked for Trump for a while, and I, I still like Trump, but I was dismayed the way he turned the reins over to Fauci. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. was just disgusting to watch those press conferences yes. where Trump stood in the background and Fauci was commanding the stage as if a guy knew how to deal with the virus, and it's not clear he really does anyway, but he just he, mm -hmm. he handed him the, the keys. Yeah. I saw a, uh, a clip or still from this recent Disney uh, special on Fauci. Yeah. And it's really telling. Fauci's working at his uh, home office beneath a larger than life size uh, portrait of Fauci. You're kidding. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I mean, I, the, 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 the arrogance of it, the, the self-importance of it is just mind-blowing. <laughs> I was thinking of a Disney cartoon when you mentioned I was trying to figure out how we'd animate him, but maybe, maybe that, that, that's he's a, he's a cartoon. cartoon. I wish he would become a cartoon. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with a couple of smart economists here. So let's talk about the labor market. What was the effect of all these payments? Why are people not going back to work? Do we ever put the genie back in the bottle in terms of uh, people going to work and the work ethic? I don't think there could be any question that if you pay people not to work, you get let fewer people working. I mean, this is this is basic economics 101. It's not been repealed by a virus. It's not been repealed by uh, uh, Trump being thrown out of office. Uh, it's it's basic economics. Putting the genie back in the bottle, I think, eventually people will have to get back to work when these funds run out. Uh, but what I worry about, this is part of the long COVID, I mean, excuse me, the long lockdown consequence that I mentioned earlier. Uh, will government allow that? Will govern? It's too tempting for politicians to say, well, it's a little bit longer. Let's come up with a new relief package because people are still scared of the virus. The long lock, it'll be part of the long lockdown. Yeah. And then, and then, and then on top of that, you have, you know, a lot of the schools are still either doing part time and they're, they're, I think many of them still feel at risk that they'll shut down if there's an outbreak, an increase in cases. So a lot of parents don't want to go back to work because they, what are they going to do with their kids if, if they're back at work and their kids are home? I agree with Don that there's a slight disagreement there that I don't even think there's necessarily disagreement on. There's no doubt if you pay people, if government is bidding against the, the market for labor, government is going to win on occasion. But I think I also speak for the three of us right here that it would cost you a lot of money to get me to stop working. I love my work so much, I can't get enough of it. And I think it's important to point, I don't think Americans have suddenly been la made lazy by a handout from government. <clears throat> I think it's got to be remembered, look at what the politicians did. And let's look at the restaurant industry specifically. There's not a lot of pediatricians married to chefs or investment bankers married to servers. There are a lot of servers married to chefs and servers married to sous chefs. So one day these people have jobs, the next parents of kids suddenly are both wiped out, no jobs to speak of. You think there's some reluctance on their part to re-enter these industries that so were so thoroughly suffocated by political panic? And so I think to some degree, a lot of these people not going back to work is because they've seen what happened. And are you gonna get back, get back on that train again? And then I, I think you also hit on something crucial 
Uh, child care is enormously expensive. So long as the schools are shut down, what are parents supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Because that, for even well-paid people, child care is basically a high salary after taxes. Yeah, and even if the schools, again, even if the schools aren't currently shut down, they are at risk of being shut yes. down. Because we're, we're constantly here. The, the teachers' unions continue to complain about, about uh, schools reopening, uh, and the teachers' unions are very powerful. And parents understand that with you know, a slight uptick in cases, their schools may shut down again. They go off to work, and who's going to watch the kids? Mm-hmm. You're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Don Bedreau and John Tamney, and we're talking about sort of the economic consequences and social consequences of all the, all the government measures. You know, the, the thing about, I, I, think, I think like an investor, that's my basic background. And I think about investing, and I think you're saying the same thing, John, about people going back to work. You don't want to deploy your capital into something if you think there's some fiat that can change the investment landscape. I mean, if you, you know, you, can, you, you mentioned that the, ho- the hospital or the, the, the restaurants adjusted to the tables and they got that going, and they could go back into business knowing that that was the landscape. But if you think it's going to change every week, you're not going to do anything, and so you're saying you're not you're not even going to you're not going to invest if you if you're if you're doing what I do, but you're not also not going to go back to work if you think it's going to get ripped away from me again. Yeah, my, 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 is that my, is that yes. is that the humans are capital? They're the most important capital. You know this as an investor. If suddenly you don't know if that's going to be truly really the, the only change, capital. I mean, it, yeah, ultimately, it, it, yeah. it is the only capital, and we suffocated suffocated in response to the virus, but we also suffocated its ability to operate in the marketplace. Is it any surprise that there's some reluctance to go back? Because remember, the assumption was once some of these payments end, uh, people were, are going to flood back in, into, the, uh, into the job market. Well, well, it turns happening. out that hasn't happened. Yeah. And because it was never true what was assumed, oh, Americans are just lazy. I found that so insulting. That, that Americans could just be bought off by a check. And I know you don't believe that, but I, 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 I think some on our side said that, and I thought, oh, you got to be kidding. I think, I think it has an impact at the margin. Not, of course it does. It has does. an impact at the margin, but the margin in this case can be pretty extensive when you're talking about a labor force of close to 160 million people. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the best economics books written in the past 50 years, a book written by the economic historian Bob Higgs, Robert Higgs, called Crisis and Leviathan. And in that, he explained, uh, excuse uh, excuse me, I'm getting his books wrong. That is one of the best books, by the way. Um, But Bob Higgs wrote another book a few years ago where he explains the length of the Great Depression. The the reason the Great Depression lasted as long as it did was because of the immense uncertainty created by New Deal policies. Yeah. Uh, Investors simply didn't want to go back in because they didn't know what the Roosevelt administration would do. And they didn't go back in until after Roosevelt died and the more conservative Harry Truman's in office and the Republicans surprisingly win in 1948. That's when the economy started really to pick back up again. I think we have the same kind, and Bob Higgs called that regime uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think we have the same kind of uncertainty now. We have regime, maybe even in a a worse way, Mm -hmm. certainly in different ways, we have great uncertainty about what the government is going to do when we have new reports about what's happening to, 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 to cases and when you have this kind of uncertainty, I think John is right on this, that that, that is a disincentive to return to the job. I um, think I think we're getting at something really fundamental here. I mean, the, with the, the arbitrariness with which these yes. governments say yes. things, it, it chills so many other things. Besides. The rule of law is out the window. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I, I know, John, you're, a, you're, a, you're more... Uh, you see China as a rosier scenario than I do, but if you look at you look at Xi in China, Xi decided recently that private tutoring was something that shouldn't be in the private sector. There, and there, there's some <laughs> big private tutoring businesses that a lot of American investors have gone into. And he decided overnight you're not allowed to make a profit if you're in the private tutoring business. Mm-hmm. We're beginning to feel a little bit like that, where you can get a governor that says, well, your business isn't essential. What's the difference? Yeah. There is no difference. Uh, I, to give you the other, not the other side on China, we see them attacking businesses. And I say, well, how's that different from Mark Zuckerberg and the CEO of Google? And any time you're successful in the United States, 
you better pay your tithe here because if you don't, you know where you're going to end up. You're going to be brought to testify before Congress and be berated by Congress. You think they're going to be disappeared like Jack Ma? <laughs> in a sense, I mean, they, he's gone. In, in a sense, they go quiet. You know this from Wall Street very well. Remember the the Fortune cover back in the 1980s of the young guy with a cigar on the cover of Fortune about how he's making 500 thousand a year, and it terrified investment bankers. Do not advertise your wealth because it gets, it gets the attention of politicians. Michael Milken, the greatest capitalist who ever lived, served time in prison for making that mistake, albeit in a different way. And so it's not to defend China, but I think politicians are universal in their desire to tell business who's boss. I mean, well, certainly the arbitrariness with which Xi did the, 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 the move against the private tutoring that you just mentioned. That is indistinguishable from the arbitrariness that the governors uh, and, 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 and in yeah. many cases mayors imposed on businesses around the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You shut down, shut down. Oh, you can stay open. Uh, mm -hmm. Great point. Completely arbitrary. And, and it, with no legislative oversight, very few courts would stand up to these people. You guys don't do politics, but there seems to be a political piece of this that's so sinister. I mean, they use the virus and the fear of uh, people interacting with each other to put all these paper ballots out and all the mail-in ballots, and they flooded the zone with mail-in ballots in 2020. Really scary. I don't think, I'm not in a camp that thinks there was a lot of tampering with the machines, but I think the paper ballots were used in an egregious manner to get a lot of votes for uh, for Biden, and maybe they Maybe they count as legitimate, maybe they don't. But then you see, fast forward to today, you see, was it Fairfax County now is saying to the governor, you've got to give us a break. We no longer need a second, we should no longer have a second signature on a mail-in ballot because people are afraid of having somebody else come close to them to sign the piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. And, and Ralph Northam in Virginia, under the emergency orders or whatever that is, if he declares it a medical emergency, he can he can edict that. Mm -hmm. So politicians have learned, and, and the media have learned, if you scare people enough, yeah. they will become sheeple, unfortunately. Uh, you may disagree with that, John, but but I, I, I think that uh, uh, people were scared. In, in, in Britain, we know. Laura Dosworth wrote a book about it. In Britain, we know the government intentionally ramped up the level of fright in order to make the British people more. I didn't know that. How so? What they, what they do? Oh, they, 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 they had a whole, they had, I forget what the, what the name of the, of the operation was, but there's a great book by Laura Dosworth. I think it's called The State of Fear. Okay. Um, uh, on on the, the very conscious effort by the British government to ramp up fear of COVID in order to entice people to become more obedient to the government's COVID restrictions. Um, no doubt a lot of these people thought they were acting in the best interests of society, but it's, it's, it's completely antithetical to the principles of a free society. We gotta wrap up. Uh, I hate to wrap up, because we're just getting deeper and deeper into something. How do we, how do we, bring, how do we restore our liberty? What, how do we develop a movement that gets people saying, gee, wait a second, enough's enough. Give us back our freedom. That's a uh, last year. Ever said sixty-four billion dollar question. Now it's sixty-four trillion. Given, trillion, given yeah. the inflation yeah. that's coming, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm. It's a difficult question to answer, Bill. But we certainly have to start with speaking out against these these arbitrary, unprecedented restrictions done in order to protect us from uh, a pathogen. It's intolerable. You can't have a free society if people are willing to be corralled and silenced just because a relatively dangerous pathogen is on the loose. I think the line of action, in my view, is got to, might start with the vaccines. Because there's got to be some pushback on these vaccines and these vaccine mandates, which uh, are correct. John? I, I, I think that it's got to be, and, and this may or may it not surprise you, I think the dangerous path we're going down right now is that we're making this stu too statistical. I get it, 99 point something percent survival rate. Anytime you use statistics, you win the argument, but you lose the war because it implies that there's a rate of death at which point politicians can take our freedom. 
No, no, no. They cannot take our freedom. And so I think the only answer is to make this about freedom, pound that over and over again, that free people on its own is essential virtue. It's a pro-health virtue in addition. It's a pro-economic growth in addition to that. But it's got to be about freedom, that we would be against lockdowns even if you could prove what you can't, that the lockdowns save lives. No, 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 no. You just don't take away freedom. Because anything else they can trample on. They can always say, well, this time is different. This one's more lethal. Uh, this time we can lo lock people down without any kind of ac economic implications. There's always going to be an excuse, at which point we've got to make it about free people. That, that's the only answer. It's a wrap. Thanks, John. That's pretty good. Yeah. I think that's a good. Don, we're, Cafe Hayek is primarily where we can find everything you're writing and, I, and thinking. Yes, Cafe Hayek. I, Post several times each day at Cafe Hayek. Yeah, highly recommended. I also recommend getting on his email list because every day is uh, something coming through that's incredibly useful. Yeah, you can so sign thanks. up. You can sign up at the site. It's great Let's service. Think. Yeah, John, where do we find you? Oh, you know, Real Clear Markets and uh, my books that uh, people should buy lots of copies. <laughs> we should buy lots of yeah, books, especially when politicians uh, yeah. panic. That's uh, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. We got to keep John in the uh, in the writing business. So anyway, thanks for joining us. This has been Bill, Bill Walton's show and uh, Don Bedreau and John Tamney. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the conversation we had about the uh, price we're paying for the uh, draconian measures against the lockdown. But There'll be more to come and more to talk about, and we hope you join us, uh, join us back then. So thanks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one, and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.